And first on BBC One, the nine o'clock news with Peter Sissons. Tony Blair's ministers have agreed the first measures to start fulfilling Labour's election promises. At their first cabinet meeting, education leads a list of 22 bills that will be contained in next week's Queen's speech. Ireland's Prime Minister says Tony Blair's majority gives him a freer hand to find a Northern Ireland solution. And American scientists claim a new cocktail of drugs has achieved dramatic success against AIDS. Good evening. A Labour cabinet sat around the table at number 10 today for the first time since 1979 and approved the list of measures they hope will keep up the momentum of the party's landslide win and which will be set out in the Queen's speech next week. It's a programme for the first year and a half of government and includes bills on crime, health, devolution and jobs and above all education. From Westminster, our political editor Robin Oakley reports. Cameras were allowed in for a peek at the small talk preview to the first Labour cabinet meeting for 18 years. The Prime Minister told them not to use the traditional job titles, but to call each other by the first names they were used to. Like his MPs, they too got a homily on discipline and unity, and they agreed they'd meet Gordon Brown's pre-election pledge not to take the pay rises awarded for their jobs this year a decision costing Mr Blair £41,000 and his colleagues £16,000 apiece. The meeting agreed on a hefty programme of 22 bills for next Wednesday's Queen's speech. Education will be the priority. One bill will abolish the assisted places scheme to help reduce class sizes below 30 for five to seven year olds. Another will seek to raise school standards and crack down on poor teachers. A health bill will end the internal market in the NHS. On finance, following an early budget, the Chancellor will introduce a windfall tax on privatised utilities, like water and electricity, to pay for the welfare into work scheme. And he'll cut VAT on fuel from 8 to 5%. Another bill will set up the Commission to help determine the level of a statutory minimum wage. A crime bill will provide fast-track punishment for persistent young offenders. The radical touch will come on the Constitution, with provision for referendums on a Scottish Parliament and a Welsh Assembly. The Deputy Prime Minister was well pleased with the programme for the next 17 months in Parliament. It reflects all those priorities that we had in the general election, that of education, of crime, of jobs, decentralisation and devolution, all those priorities that we gave on our card. And uh, I'm looking forward to implementing that programme and showing that a different government can make a difference, and that's what our Queen's speech will reflect. But some plans must wait. As ministers left after today's meeting, it emerged that a Freedom of Information bill won't come until there's been a consultative document first. As MPs, including Tony Blair and John Major, began swearing in for the new session, it was confirmed too that before law changes on party political contributions, the Nolan Committee on Standards will be asked to pronounce. Such news had the Liberal Democrats worrying about backsliding. Our worry is that the priority they say they're giving to education and health is not backed by the resources those services need and we'll be pressing very hard on those issues. The Cabinet today approved a mammoth programme for a session which will now run on till autumn next year. But some questions remain, like whether the Chancellor will introduce more than a windfall tax in his summer budget and whether the government's plans for reforming the House of Lords are to be placed on the back burner. Robin Oakley, BBC News, Westminster. The government's first new law is expected to be the emergency bill to lower class sizes for five, six and seven-year-olds to no more than 30. It should be in place by the summer. A bill on educational standards will be introduced in the autumn. Our education correspondent, Mike Baker, looks at the changes the proposals will bring. Emmanuel School in South London gets around a million pounds a year from the Assisted Places scheme. It'll start to lose that when the Class Sizes Bill becomes law. The short bill will phase out the subsidy for independent schools, releasing money to start cutting infant class sizes from September next year. Critics of the plan say it won't save enough money to make much impact on class sizes 
yet it'll deny bright children from poorer homes the chance to go to schools otherwise reserved for the better off. We get a very, very large number of requests and uh, for pupils to come to the school on assisted places. The assisted places is heavily oversubscribed and we get situations where pupils are not making progress in the schools that they are and the parents are desperate to move them. And for those pupils, it will be very sad. Councils in places like Kingston, Surrey, where 80% of infant classes have over 30 pupils, hope the money will make a difference. This week, National Education Authority leaders sent ministers their ideas for phased reduction of class sizes, targeting those councils with the greatest number of large classes and requiring them to show how they'd use the money. We've got to make sure that the money gets into the schools, which needed to reduce their class sizes. We needed to make sure that the authorities, when they get the money, know exactly how it's going to be spent to be most effective. It is a limited amount of money and therefore it must be used most efficiently and most effectively. The main standards bill will change the status of opted out schools and allow parental ballots on the future of grammar schools. The government sources insist the main thrust will not be school structures but standards, focusing on tackling school failure and improving basic skills. Abolishing nursery vouchers does not need legislation and could happen by the autumn, releasing some of the administrative costs to be spent on new nursery places. Education ministers say they'll consult widely and promise no big upheaval in school structure. That's meant to reassure opted out and grammar schools. Nevertheless, Labour is now set for the first major education act of its history. Mike Baker, BBC News at the Department for Education. The former Deputy Prime Minister Michael Heseltine has undergone successful treatment in hospital to widen the arteries around his heart. Doctors say he should be able to return home in a few days. The Conservative MP Sir Michael Shersby has died at the age of 64. He had represented Uxbridge in West London since 1972. The Tory party chairman, Dr Brian Mawinney, said he was a dedicated and hard-working MP who would be sadly missed. The Northern Ireland Secretary, Mo Molam, has said it's very unlikely Sinn Féin will be allowed into multi-party talks on the province's future when they reopen next month, even if the IRA declares a new ceasefire. She was speaking after the first talks between Tony Blair and the Irish Prime Minister, John Bruton. Mr Bruton said he'd been encouraged by Mr Blair's positive response on many issues. Here's our island correspondent, Dennis Murray. John Bruton was being fated at a reception in the Irish Club in London tonight. He met leaders of the Irish community in Britain. The end of a most satisfactory day for him. With the general election looming in the Irish Republic, to be the first European head of government to meet Tony Blair is no harm at all. But the meeting was also a measure of how highly both governments placed the Northern Ireland question. Mr Bruton said Mr Blair's government had one thing in common and one difference with that of John Major. Both were deeply engaged in finding a solution, but the Mr Blair's majority gave him a freer hand to be decisive. What struck me about all his response to all the issues he raised, and I must have raised somewhere in the region of 20 to 30 different issues, that on all of them there was an immediate indication of a positive willingness to engage. And that is most heartening from, from our point of view, and I think should give a lot of uh, hope to people uh, in Northern Ireland who are wondering how long is this agony going to continue. And how long before a new IRA ceasefire? Both governments would prefer Sinn Féin to be in the multi-party talks, which resume early next month. It's now too late for that, despite the new Northern Ireland Secretary's pre-election hopes, and any new cessation must be genuine. What counts is the quality of it, and Sinn Féin and the IRA know exactly what that means. And so, in that sense, it's up to them to give us the possibility of uh, a ceasefire, the ball is in their court. I'm not sure that June the 3rd is, the 3rd is a possibility. As I've said before, uh, the timescale now is very short and I'm not sure that it's a, a possibility. That means it's absolutely not a possibility. One more reminder in the earliest days of the new government that there are very few quick solutions to Northern Ireland's problems. A good start to this new chapter in Anglo-Irish relations is how both sides characterise today. And both governments also laid stress on building confidence with unionists and nationalists in Northern Ireland, particularly in regard to the summer marching season, which so divided the province last year. Dennis Murray, BBC News, Westminster. President Mobutu.